Data Bites, which is a weekly lunch talk series by Data and Society. Um, I'm Ingrid Burrington, I'm a fellow here, and I'm super excited to have Aaron Cope talking about stuff he's been working on. Aaron's probably one of my favorite um, internet humans and makers of things. Um, I've said to people before, like, I want to live on an internet that's the way that Aaron makes the internet, um, and hopefully that will make sense to you when you, when you hear him talking about stuff, so. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, so these are kind of, uh, this is gonna be an interesting slide thing. Um, talking to Seth, I got the sense that um, it's, usually better and more interesting, and what tends to happen is that um, the talks just get thrown open to the floor um, and it becomes an open discussion. So um, you'll see the slides in a minute. They're sort of just meant to be soundtrack to everything that um, I'll start by talking about and I'll just leave them up. Uh, I apologize in advance, those links are really little teeny tiny things. Um, I'll send them out uh, because I'm only gonna do a sort of quick introduction um, the first one is a 13,000 word uh, paper that my colleague Seb Chan and I wrote about all the work that we've been doing uh, for the reopening. Um, so it gets into all of the gory details if you're interested. The second one is a lovely piece that Robertson Meyer wrote uh, in The Atlantic about the work that um, the larger team that I'm on has been doing. Uh, the third one is a talk that I did both about the the project, which involved um, a museum doing straight up product design and manufacturing from scratch. Uh, the good news is it's, re it's possible. Um, just to put this in context, uh, it's, this has been on the floor of the museum for two months now. Um, so March 2015 is when it launched. February 2014, this was pure vapor. This didn't exist at all. Um, there was a Hail Mary pass to an electronics firm in Spain um, that was caught, so that was good. Um, it was a huge amount of work. Uh, I'm not sure I would recommend it to anyone, um, but the good news is it turns out you can do this level of product design in a year in small batches. Not like hundreds, we did a f you know, but thousands. Um, so I'll pass this around, I have props, I'll share it with everybody. Um, so the third paper is about, the third talk is, link is about that, but it was also about a lot of the motivations that I've been thinking about for why museums do this stuff at all uh, for the last three years. Uh, and the fourth one is probably closer to some of the things that you guys are working on here. Um, it was a talk I did, uh, I was invited to speak at the MoMA R&D Salon on big data. Um, and I was trying to talk about it in the context of cultural heritage institutions, and I'll touch on some of that. Um, towards the end. So, uh, a panopticon of taste. I think I went to the last MoMA R&D salon where they were talking about algorithms and I'm pretty sure this is what a guy actually said. And I was like, what does that mean? That's terrifying. Um, but it's an interesting way to think about museums. So, uh, a few years ago, I heard an interview with the filmmaker Hal Hartley. Um, and if you've never seen any of his films, um, one of the things that characterizes them is a sort of almost aggressively precise and very clipped dialogue. It's kind of weird. Um, and in the interview, he was saying, he said, you know when you have an argument with somebody and you spend the next three days thinking about like that perfect comeback? He said, I try to write dialogue as if everybody had that perfect comeback, like in the moment. <laughs> um, and that's a kind of weird way to, to think about stuff. So that's a bit of a non sequitur. The second non sequitur is one of the issues that, that a lot of the stuff we've been doing at the museum around how we've developed <coughs> the infrastructure and how we've developed the model for working and the capacity for working stems from this problem that's endemic in almost all organizations, which is that there is a fear of that, that version two will never arrive. You talk to a lot of people in organizations and they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> We're never gonna revisit this project. There is only the launch. And so you see like organizations just develop these like ridiculously dysfunctional work habits. 
everything is front loaded into a single launch because no one believes that anyone will ever come back to the problem, which is crazy because we have to. Um, so, I realized I didn't do complete introductions. I guess it was probably in the email. Um, my name is Aaron. I'm the head of engineering at the Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian uh, Design Museum. So, first of all, it's all your stuff. It's the Smithsonian. It's for you. Uh, we have been closed for three years. We reopened in December. Um, and there were three reasons for closing. One is um, we're in Andrew Carnegie's old mansion, and so we decided that what we really needed to do was polish it up. Um, oh, wait, this is being recorded. Um, <laughs> Andrew Carnegie's house is awesome. <laughs> um, no, I mean, it's a super impressive building. Uh, and it needed to be restored. It hadn't been in ages. Uh, so we took the place down to studs and posts. We took all of the woodwork off. It was all cleaned with toothbrushes. And it's a pretty remarkable piece of architecture. The second was to give ourselves increased space. Um, this is an old historic home. and. Um, and we're, we're not allowed to do anything with it because you can't tear down the walls. So we have all these little tiny rooms, which makes it hard to show anything. So we did an expansion up on the third floor. We have 60% more space. Um, and the third reason was to try and figure out what it means to operate a museum in the world where the internet exists. What are those parts of the network that, that allow us to do something we couldn't do before and that we wouldn't willingly give up and to try and figure out what that intersection is. Um, and so early on in the design phase, uh, the designers we were working with, which are local projects in DSR, the architecture firm here, we were given a slide that was really just, it was this. It was somebody holding a stylus, it was a hand, and all it said was, this is your ticket. And I think that the idea behind that one slide was meant to be one of those things that are just get the creative juices going. Just like, what is it that you really want to be able to do with this museum? What does the museum represent? Right? Sort of aspirational, abstract concepts. Um, and it was also meant to be the pen, so it was a pen, it was a stylus. And this was meant to be an invitation to people. This was meant to say that one, we're a design museum, which is about process. You're invited to do something. And two, this is not an art museum. And three, even though you're in Andrew Carnegie's house, you are allowed to participate. Um, we have large interactive tables scattered throughout the museum that allow you to uh, browse larger parts of the collection as well as create stuff on them. And so this was a device to give people to actually do stuff. But the other thing that it said was, what if you could use that pen to collect objects throughout the museum? And for us, that became the thing. It was that idea of, what if you could go to the museum and simply remember your visit? And simply remember your visit without having to spend 50% of your time futzing around with a device. You know, we don't, what we've been saying is the only reason you should need to get out your phone is if you want to take a picture. We're a tiny little space and we don't want, we can't have people walking around like this the whole time because they'll bump into each other and knock something over. But beyond that, at some point, if if as museums we're going to keep going down that road of saying to everybody, like, just get your device out, and that is a huge thing in museums right now. Everyone's like, sweet, all of our technology problems are solved because everyone's got an iPhone. They come pre-equipped with this stuff. Then it really starts to undermine the function of the building itself. We want to encourage people to have a heads up visit. Um, and so the way this works, I'll pass this around in a minute, uh, is this is an NFC enabled pen. So there's a little NFC uh, antenna here. There's a small amount of storage on board. And every single wall label has a crosshair on it. It's smaller than this. Um, and what you do is you simply walk up to it 
and you touch it, and the pen lights up and vibrates, and you've just recorded the ID for that object onto your pen. Um, and every single visitor is given a ticket. So it's the usual museum thing where you peel off the stuff. Um, but you'll see when I pass this around, this has a little short URL on it. So that is the unique URL for your visit. And by default, it's anonymous. We encourage people to create uh, accounts with the museum, um, but you don't have to. We're really like, it's not our business if you want to come to the museum and collect all the like ceramic figurines. That's your business. Um, and that's it. That's all we've done. We've built the world's most complicated bookmarking system. Uh, but it turns out that you know, this is the minimum amount of hardware. And this was a huge project. And so that's why I mentioned the 13,000 word essay, because it gets into all the, the details. Um, what we want to be able to do is simply let people touch things, to reach out and simply go, hmm. Huh. Um, you're not meant to come to the museum and have a pen experience. The pen is not meant to be invisible necessarily, but it is meant to be very, very quiet and very polite. The first time you come, everyone's like, hey, pen, pen, it's fun. You can press it three times and make it vibrate, right? And the second time, it is that idea that, you know, I can be walking through the museum with Ingrid and we can be talking and, you know, we actually do have a, a, an air book or a Mac book air on in the museum, I can do this. I can be talking to Ingrid, blah, 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 that's it. Um, and what that means is that we hope visitors will come to the museum with the confidence that their visit can simply be remembered, that fundamentally they have recall. Because recall is one of the things that the network has made possible in a way that never was possible before. And, net, and recall has always been a power dynamic, right? And so what does it mean in 2015 for an institution, and specifically a public institution? That's why I started out by saying, like, the Smithsonian is yours. Um, what does it mean for us to say, we'll keep your visit? You know, we're not going to apply the same level of standards that we do to all of those objects that we, we keep. But we're in a position where we can actually start to think about taking care of some of that stuff. Maybe we should. And so, you know, early on, three years ago when we started all of this, we started building out the infrastructure that runs everything in the museum, and that was the collections website. The collections website has been online for three years, uh, and it is always meant to be a reflection of the direction that we're going. And the first thing we said was every single object has a stable, permanent URL, right? <laughs> Seriously, it was 2013. It's not rocket science, but for museums, it was kind of a big deal. Um, and by extension, every act of collecting something or creating something on the tables because you can save your own creations has a permanent URL. You can delete stuff if you want. If you pair a visit with your account, everything becomes private and you can make stuff public. But it is that idea that in 100 years, that URL should still work. That's all we do. We're the Smithsonian. Um, and so we've been trying to think about what it means for cultural heritage institutions to start to take on the responsibility for, in some ways, you could think about it as ancillary material, right? Sort of all of the the effluvia that accumulates around the exhibitions or the objects themselves, people's visits. And this is really important to us because we're not an art museum. We're a design museum. So we are increasingly being forced to deal with systems. Uh, so like every design museum in the world, we have a nest. Right? I mean, whatever. The nest is a lovely, it's a, it's a remarkable piece of industrial hardware. But we have not bothered to collect any data associated with it ever. We don't have a way, like, what would it mean if you as a, as a visitor could say, I'd like to give you my data from my nest, right? Let's just set aside all the privacy issues for a second and just be like, I want to share this with you because that helps to inform 
the object itself. What is important about this? A nest, absent its data, is a lump of raw materials. An iPhone, absent the ability to think about or investigate touch and swipe, is just a remarkable piece of industrial design and manufacturing. But that's it. And that, if that's all we're going to preserve of an iPhone, you're sort of like, I think we're missing the point. Likewise, with the Nest, we were not in a position to say to them, please, um, can we have the source code? Right? Because they turned around a month later and sold it for $3 billion. And that's, uh, you know, just as first principles go, I've got no problem with that. But what we don't have is a way to say to designers or individuals who are wrapped up in all of these designs, what if there was a way for us to take in this data or this source code and create you know, some kind of escrow for intellectual property? What does it mean for an institution like the Smithsonian to say, we will keep this stuff safe from the present, but for the future. Um, that's some serious hand-waving territory right there, uh, because there's a lot of details to work through. And it's a huge technical infrastructure problem. And the Smithsonian is not there yet. No cultural heritage institution is there yet. We don't know how to do this, um, but maybe we should. Um, and it, you know, the other example that I always use when I talk about this is if there's any one thing that I would like to, as a design museum, collect from Apple, it is the foam models that they create in-house in their design shops. Those are the most interesting things. And they will never give that up, and I totally understand it. But maybe, maybe now that we have all of this Cap all these capabilities. We have data storage. We have an, an internet. We have cheap electricity for the time being. Um, maybe we should start to think about proactively collecting some of this stuff, because it is all of those instances that start to demonstrate the sort of velocity or the arc of a project. Um, so. This is, uh, this is where the title from the, the email starts to come into play. Um, I've spent five or 10 years in the cultural heritage sector now, five working sort of full, three working full time, five to seven kind of hovering around the edges. Uh, and I have spent a lot of time talking to people about magic databases for investigating cultural heritage and investigating the past. And this idea that cultural heritage institutions will create taxonomies so that they can share their data with one another, and that we can do magical cross-institutional search, and we can do inferences, and we can see what really happened. We can understand the past. And you know who's done that? If the stories are to be believed, is the NSA. You're like every single project that they've been working on, when you look at the details, you're like, wow, <laughs> those tools would be awesome in cultural heritage. And what that really starts to suggest is those would be awesome when the sting of the present is removed from that data. And I think this is the problem that everyone is dealing with right now. When you, again, we, you know, the, the, thing about, the thing about all the stories is we have no way to prove or disprove them, right? So it's like this quantum possibility of infinite possibility space. Um, but if it's true, if all of that data has been recorded in maybe a generation, maybe 10 generations, who knows how long, that data will stop being poison to the people who are its subject. And it will be a rich treasure trove of cultural heritage data. Um, and I think you know, the reason I smushed all of this together and the reason I started with the Hal Hartley thing was there is this question of recall and how we deal with it. You know, I mean, what, 
What the security apparatus has at its disposal right now is that ability, they have almost perfect recall. They can go back and revisit assumptions. They can revisit questions, which is, again, once you separate out the individuals, is fundamentally what the Cultural Heritage Project is. It is always a revisiting. It is always a reinterpretation. Um, so I'm just going to leave it there. Um, I will pass around the, the gadgets. Um, I can talk at great, great length about what we did at the museum and the motivations um, and the, the technical details if people want to. Um, but I'm also happy just to talk about you know, what it means for cultural heritage institutions just to, well, how would you feel if we actually started taking responsibility for preserving individuals? Like, what if we could preserve, maybe not this is the way we do the Elgin marbles, but maybe something in between. What if there was a way for us to actively preserve more voices than we do now? And maybe that's the challenge and the opportunity that we have, which is to, to think about it and to articulate that superpower as a social contract, not just a technological inevitability or real politic. Yeah. You're on the record now and forever. This better be a good question. It's, it's for the recording. Okay. Um, my question was just. How do you make these large collections meaningful? If, if we were able to preserve sort of an individual or multiple individuals, how do you make them meaningful? And I was thinking, um, there's a collection at the Bodley and someone donated all of the everyday stuff that they collected, like receipts and tickets and everything, over, I, I, don't, I think it's like a 40 year period. So they have all of this heritage for themselves. and, and, and and you know, it's very difficult to figure out how to make that meaningful for other people as far as their interpretation and experience. Um, so yeah, it's a very good question. Uh, I think what we have done to date is we have relied on experts alone. We have relied on curatorial staff. And you know, seriously, they're pretty good at what they do. They spend a lot of time thinking about it. Um, I have been joking lately, or for the last three years, that the Smithsonian has the world's largest conceptual art collection. And the reason I say that is because we have 137 million objects. We have more stuff than pretty much anyone. Um, and the good news is it, they're actually there, uh, and people are taking care of them, and right, all of your stuff is safe. The bad news is, is that the only you have no proof, right? It's a leap of faith. As a citizen, when I say that to you, you're like, okay, they wouldn't have given him his job otherwise. And you're like, well, <laughs> right? There is nothing there. Um, and so what we did with our collections website and what a lot of other people are doing with theirs is um, one of the issues that we have is most of the metadata for most of the objects is utter crap, right? We've it's total garbage. Um, but what we did was we said, this thing exists. And a URL is just a proxy. Like a web page is not the answer. But it is what we've got right now. Because right now, what you have is nothing. You have trust or blind faith in me. Or you have something that you can share with somebody else. And we, get out of, we should get out of the way. We don't need to be all up in your junk about whether you sharing a link with somebody about an object is meaningful or not. It's meaningful to you and whoever you're sharing it with. And so what we're trying to do is, is create a system where those objects begin to achieve weight and mass in the universe, that they become a, a communal proof. Um, and from there, we let people make their own peace with these things. We let people find their own meaning in them. Um, that doesn't prevent us from you know, having the curatorial staff tell stories about it. But again, what 
the network makes possible is that it, it's no longer just that. You know, you having an opinion about something doesn't undermine our institutional opinion about it. So. You know this, but I'm going to say it for the room. I'm on the board of the um, National Museum of the American Indian. And um, one of the responsibilities that we have from Congress is to uh, repatriate um, millions of remain, human remains of native peoples. Um, most of those remains were acquired through uh, war. Um, and basically, large amounts of abuses where people felt they had the right to these human remains, to these skulls, to these, to these objects because they have achieved them successfully through war activities and they are the rightful owner. Um, and of course, history has now come around to say that that's a really fucked up way of thinking about things. Um, and so the repatriation uh, process is to recognize that actually there's this different way of understanding possession. Now the reason I, I use that as an example is that what's interesting to me is how we understand the intellectual property of today versus what we might think of it 150 or 200 years from now. And I think of the Smithsonian as this interesting institution that is not just about the present, but about imagining all the various versions of the future. Mm -hmm. So right now, most of the way in which we talk about data uh, and we talk about possession, and this is coming to your, to your point about um, what it would mean for you to give over your data, is about what you individually might control or own. But actually, most of what you have as data actually tells a lot of things about other people. And so all of a sudden, these artifacts that I might donate to the Cooper Hewitt um, that are my data, I bet you history is going to tell us that actually there's a lot of power plays in mind there. Me giving away data that is effectively the data of my kin or the data of my children or the data of other people through interpretation. <clears throat> and so I'm curious how we can actually understand some shifts in the ideas of property and ownership over time to think then about the future and the responsibility and the, the ethical challenges of a museum as it might think about engaging individuals, <clears throat> individual rights and individual properties. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's the work. Um, I guess, uh, so yeah, there's no question that cultural heritage institutions have a, a, a fine and rich tradition of looting and pillaging. Um, but, you know, to touch on, to, to answer your question and to touch on the last one, one of the, well, let me go back, let me say it differently. I've done, early on when I was doing talks about the collections website and why we were doing this at all, I would always have a slide that the government digital services people, picture that the government digital services people took of their offices in London. And it was a sheet of, 18 by 24 inch newsprint um, that they had taped to the window and they had just torn out a section and it just had the word users with an arrow pointing down and so they would just move it around the windows and they'd be like this is who we're doing it for um, and that's important again especially for public institutions to remember that I have the luxury of my position because you and everyone out there thinks it's important enough to have an institution like the Smithsonian. If the Smithsonian or the Library of Congress were to go away tomorrow, my assertion is they would be rebuilt. The details might be different, but fundamentally that there is that idea that we understand that preserving the past is important. We have always done it. Um, and yes, the advantage that the Smithsonian has is we're not, you know, the U.S. isn't going anywhere, so we are effectively a museum of the near future. We have to pay attention to it. Um, and I think the, the thing that I was trying to get at, and it's not to, it's not to skirt the issues you've raised, but the opportunity we have now that we've never been able to have is for a kind of voluntary participation. That you know, you hear these stories all the time about people trying to finagle their life, because fundamentally that's what it's about, right? They're trying to finagle their life's work into a communal institution that will outlive them. There's a fairly famous story that the librarian at MoMA got up one day, I think it was in the 70s, maybe the early 80s, 
and said, if you send something to me registered mail, it will get into the collection of MoMA. <laughs> I thought there were a whole lot of artists who were like, sweet. And you know, that was about a bunch of things. It was about professional reputation, but it was also about longevity. Um, how we deal with the fact that, how we deal, so there were two things. One is, I was, I, I was getting off the subway yesterday and I noticed one of the MTA signs that said, don't be a victim of opportunity, all right? And it was like, don't, don't leave your bag open so someone can just walk up and take it away from you. And I remember thinking, that's such a strange way to think, like, wait, when did we start thinking about being victimized by opportunity? Because opportunity is pretty central and core to at least the American myth. And it's a very much, it's a capitalist myth. So you can talk about politics and economics if we want. But America is predicated on the ability of one person to see opportunity where no one else has and to reap the rewards. So I think, yeah, part of the problem we have right now with data is that it is <laughs> a rich explosion of opportunity. That it is so, I think what I would say to, to maybe finally answer your question is that the opportunity that a cultural heritage institution has is to lay those issues on the table squarely and just address them and say, here's the problem that everyone has, which is we want, people I think fundamentally want to contribute. They just, they would like, not even to contribute, to participate. My life is a part of this larger story. Um, and then for the institutions to say, how long do we, what's the buffer that we need to establish around this? Um, and yeah, First Nations, I mean, I'm from Canada, so First Nations is like a whole other can of worms. Um, yeah. Um, I'm not sure how this, will relate to what you've been saying, but so thinking about the user's experience, I come, I use the pen, I get a URL that remembers details of my visit. But for me, obviously, the visit itself was a lot more than the things that I saw. It's my associations with those things, my memories, maybe it's conversations that I had with a person mm -hmm. who worked with, who I walked with. Uh, and that seems to be kind of the problem of recall writ large in everything that I've got stored digitally, which is that my devices are very good at remembering things that I have seen, but they're not very good, A, at helping me find those things afterwards, nor at associating those things with other things. So they're a very poor substitute for the way my own memory works. Mm -hmm. So is that, but then the, the experiences that people have when they come to the museum and the associations they make are in some ways part of this larger fabric of the cultural you know, the, the larger cultural fabric the museum is trying to access, I think, mm -hmm. right? In other words, the museum has, has a nexus of people's experiences of the museum. Is that something that you can imagine down the line happening in some way or another? Yes. Um, you know, right now we have been, uh, you know, out of necessity dealing with foundational work. Um, everything that you've described doesn't, you can't do it unless you have that infrastructure of you know, knowing where things are, knowing how to reference them. I mean, we've made a very large collection of reference. Uh, and on some levels, you know, our role is not to be, uh, is not to be your memory. What we are trying to do is to be generous in how we operate to make it possible for you to do, to make those memories and those larger constructions, those larger narratives, even possible at all. One of the things that, you know, one of the issues that the museum has to face now, and I think it will probably be even harder than just getting that damn thing out the door, is being patient. Um, because not everyone is gonna warm up to what that ability that the pen affords makes possible. Um, and I think, 
Lots of people get it right away, but I think what will be even more important is for somebody to come to the museum and to see something that sort of catches their eye and be like, no, 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 collect that. And then two months later, you're out at the bar with a friend and you're like, that thing, it was orange, right? And good luck, right? It's gone. You'll never be able to find that. Not on a museum's website, on the web, on your phone. Like, we try to make search not bad, but, you know, orange doesn't really narrow it down. Um, and so by extension, the museum just becomes a reminder of life's many injustices <laughs> versus, you know, and this is predicated on having paired your account or having your ticket ID handy, which is unlikely, I grant you. But if you can, if you can be like, oh yeah, I was there in August, then you can do two things. You can get out your phone, you know, your magic device that's connected to the sky. Like that, pretty awesome. Like the ability to do that is amazing. And you can be like, okay, I was there in August. You can be like, orange thing. But then more importantly, you can do this. You can put your phone away. Um, and so there is that sense that you, again, it's that question of having confidence that we can be, that the Smithsonian, that a public institution can be a reliable piece of infrastructure that you can build on for whatever you want. I mean, there's nothing technically that prevents us from allowing visitors to upload their own photos of the objects that they've collected. Um, I will say, having worked at a photo sharing website, that it's a huge social issue, like it's a social problem. Um, you need community managers for that, and we're not in any position to do that yet. Uh, but yeah, we could totally do it. We could start to imagine <coughs> You know, but we could start to be, you know, especially as a design museum, quite a lot of the stuff that we have, you have at home. And so it becomes interesting to us as a way to let you upload photos or share stories about them. Um, and again, it starts to add to the larger narrative around the object. Two things. I'm also a Canadian. <laughs> so nice to have another Hello. Canadian here. Um, and I've been to the museum, and it's fantastic. Thank you. Um, my question is, what are you guys doing with the data? So are you guys watching where the URLs are being shared to, or who else is clicking on them? Are you going back to the photos themselves? And then my other question is, you know, what do you see as the purpose or the motivation for people to use this? Do you see it as a, I can see for like teens, it would be very much weirdly like an identity building exercise where they're collecting objects. Um, it could also be a very kind of commercial exercise as well, because um, a lot of these objects can kind of either be bought um, mm -hmm. or they can um, propel kind of buying similar objects. So is that what was intended? And um, yeah, I just want to hear your thoughts on that. Um. So we are collecting a fair amount of data. Um, we are, day to day, what I use that data mostly for is to make sure that everything's still working. Um, I look for spikes and dips. <laughs> uh, afterwards, um, after that, yeah, un undoubtedly we will do some kind of analysis of the data. Um, it's too soon for that. I mean, we're just, you know, we're still just trying to work out the kinks. Um, and then, uh, yeah, the, the opportunity to be creepy is there, um, but there's no plans to be. And I mean, this is, this is we've, we've been aware of the potential for, you know, just data mining the hell out of it. Um, so we have tried to be mindful that of a few things. Uh, one is it's not a technological solution, it's a social issue inside the museum. Like we have a mandate, so maybe we should remember that and not be creepy, just, you know, for starters. Just because we can doesn't mean we should. Uh, and the other is we've gone out of our way to say to people, you can have an anonymous visit. I mean, there's always a way to correlate the data. Um, 
But you know, are there plans to monetize the hell out of your visit? No. <laughs> uh, and then as far as what the purpose is, we're, we're waiting for people to find out. We believe that what's, what's core and fundamental is the ability to essentially bookmark something, to take notes. People do that in museums all the time. People always have. People take pictures of, I mean, what we say to people is, you know, have you been to a museum? And the answer is yes. And we say, have you ever taken a picture of a wall label? And lots of people say yes. And then the question is, how's that working out for you? And everyone's like, oh. We're like, imagine if you just didn't have to do that. And from there, what does that make possible? Like, what can you do with that simple ability? So, I don't know if that answers the. Um, so I come from the library world, so I kind of have that perspective and um, sort of relate to this last question and maybe some of the others is um, what's difficult in the library world about using the data of what people are using or um, like within the library what they're checking out and what they're using is this whole idea that libraries are very concerned about privacy and intellectual freedom and your ability to go to a library and do whatever you need to do and you have, you have that ability to do that without surveillance. So that's kind of a, it's an issue for libraries in the 21st century because we have all this data about our users now. Yep. And it's figuring out then what's appropriate ways to do that. So when you were talking about um, kind of this interest in, in preserving individuals, sort of like all that treasure trove, of, treasure trove of information that would be like in what NSF collected, do cultural heritage uh, institutions like museums feel like it's their their role to um, to take on and preserve those because I imagine museums have a different um, a different set of sort of ethical guidelines around the keeping of and preserving of information than libraries would. Mm -hmm. So um, so is there kind of uh, talks around that if if you're if you wanted to sort of be responsible for preserving all this data about individuals other than they're just sort of being this vague social contract of museums should be protecting this or should be concerned about this is there you know what kind of discussions are happening in the museum world around how how you would then protect all this data that you want to preserve and, and keep into the future yeah in the museum world a lot of people I think are just trying to dodge the issue <laughs> um, uh, we come at it very much from the fact that we're a design museum. Um, and so this is, a, I've, I've done this a few times. I've done talks where I've stood up and I've been like, so here is a picture of an AK-47. And this AK-47 is from the uh, Mikhail Kalishnikov Museum in, I think it's Ivetsk, Ivetsk in Russia. And it was from the first batch of prototype rifles that were produced in 1948 and that were shown to the Russian army, who went on to standardize on the rifle in 1949. Here is a picture of a second AK-47. This one uh, is from the uh, Museum of American History at the Smithsonian. Uh, it is a Chinese-made AK-47 from 1967. I have yet, no one will tell me why we have it. It's really weird. People get pretty silent when you bring up the AK-47. Uh, but it's really there. And I was like, I like to believe that Mao Zedong gave it to Richard Nixon in 1972 because then it becomes like the embodiment of the Cold War in one object. I'm like, here's a third picture of an AK-47. Uh, this one belongs to the CIA Museum, which really exists. Um, they have a, an epic collection of terrible, terrible paintings. <laughs> um, and this one was acquired in 2012 it is Osama bin Laden's rifle. Fixed. No joke. Um, and I was like, you know, when you look at that rifle that the CIA museum has, you're like, it's pretty much like the, the Tower of Vendome in Paris, which Napoleon made from the melted down cannons of the Europeans and the English. He was just like, ha ah. And I'm like, if you think I'm just being provocative, stop for a minute and imagine if that rifle had been acquired by the Kalishnikov Museum. 
right? Like people in this country would have gone crazy. So then I'm like, by now you've figured out that all three photos are from Wikipedia. It's the same rifle. But I could have just as easily told you that uh, here's a fourth AK-47 that after careful scholarship and research, we have established its provenance, and it is the very first AK-47 ever given to a child soldier in Africa. And that it will be on display at a museum that's going to open in the Central Democratic Republic of Congo about child warfare and the mineral rights that have, the mineral wars that have played Africa for, you know, take your pick, how many years. And I was like, so the thing is, that last one, total made up, just out of thin air. No part of that is true. But you could be like, mm -hmm. so the issue is that for design museums, we all have the same stuff. And what becomes important are the stories that we tell about them. We have a perspective on, you know, we have a perspective on our Eames chair that hopefully is different than MoMA's perspective on their Eames chair. Um, and so in art museums, they have this, pr well, I was, yeah, the example I was going to use doesn't make any sense because it's a design museum. Right, so uh, there's the rapid response collecting unit at the Victoria Albert Museum in London. And they have recently acquired um, a pair of pants from the factory in Bangladesh that collapsed a couple of years ago and killed all the workers inside. And it's a weird object. Like that object has been accessioned into the V&A and somebody is gonna preserve that like crappy dollar store quality pair of pants forever. And the question that I think everybody should ask is, in 50 years or maybe 100 years, what's going to separate that pair of pants from anything that the Cooper Hewitt has in its collection that are pant-like? Because we've got some weird pants and you're like, I don't know, just weird pants from the past. Um, and so it becomes about this question of what is the ancillary material around it? And curators all have what's referred to as a curatorial file. That's the term of, that's the lingo for it. Um, and it's just a folder full of like notes and scratch pad and articles. Um, and it becomes that, what's interesting in that is not, is not like a radical transparency issue, right? It's like you should be allowed to work in privacy, but quite a lot of that data informs the acquisition itself. It tells you about the curator. It tells you about the motivation. Um, and so I think, you know, I think when you watch people, when you watch the way people have used the internet to communicate, to share, to simply, you know, vocalize, just to simply stand on top of a mountain and shout, you start to see that same motivation of what if there was a way to and again, the issue is how not to be creepy about it. Um, but what if there was a way to start to preserve some of that so that that could inform our understanding of these objects 200 years or more from now? Sorry, I realize these have all been really long answers. <laughs> I have a really short question, so we yes. can bounce that. Um, you said earlier that recall has always been a power dynamic. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to hear you say more about that. And so maybe in the context of, of the museum, like what's the power dynamic there and or how do you see the trend of, of that kind of power dynamic changing you know, right now and today with, with the tools we have? Um, the thing that I always, the example I always use is um, television, right? We all used to have to, and frankly we still do, right? You know, it's just there's always a thing that forces everybody to get together at 9 p.m. on Sunday or you know, take your pick, whatever it is, and like, that's what you have to do. Um, and what the web made possible was, you know, when Dana started writing, we didn't all have to get together <laughs> at like 7 p.m. on Tuesday to read Dana's next blog post. That it afforded the ability for people to discover and arrive at, at an argument, at a, a something of substance, whatever it is, uh, on their own terms that, you know, and, and really on some levels, like, you know, there are people like me who get up 
you know, I'm in swan around like a peacock and, you know, I enjoy it and it's fun and I enjoy meeting people, but that's not necessarily important for everybody. For some people, the, the sort of proverbial community of five is all they need. Um, but God help you if you're trying to find a community of five outside the norm in a small town in northern British Columbia. Um, so that ability for people to, you know, project something out into the world and to have it, you know, yeah, who knows, right? It's only been 20 years and, and maybe the arc of that thing is, will only last another 10 years. So it had a lifespan of 30 years if you publish something in the 90s. I don't know. You know, 30 years ago that had a lifespan of maybe 10 miles if you were lucky. Um, so that's kind of what I'm getting at with that idea is that, you know, people can, people can revisit these things on their own terms, which I think is really important. Um, and I, you know, I would apply that same argument to cultural heritage artifacts, which is that, so the Cooper Hewitt has 217,000 objects in its collection, of which we only have capacity for somewhere between five to 700 to put on the floor at any given moment. Which means that if we rotated stuff once a year, and that's, even that's hard for us, which is a whole other story, you would have to live to be, you know, in the neighborhood of 400 years old to see everything. And at some point, you know, both as an employee and a citizen, I'm just like, why are we keeping this stuff? So, you know, again, the network doesn't solve all the problems, but it, it's, it's at least a step in the right direction. Or we try to think about it, you know, when we did the collections website, we launched it and we did a public alpha, which again, for anyone outside the museum world is just like, eh, whatever. For us, it was, you know, for the sector, it was a big deal. Like, wow, they're admitting that it might not be perfect. And we were like, we know, it's not perfect. And what we're trying to do is demonstrate, you know, the sort of arc of intention. So. the notion of how these artifacts can relate to one another and the stories that they can be told. So part of the curatorial beauty is to lay things out in, a, in itself a story. And that story has to be constrained by a physical space. One of the things that's nice about what you can do digitally is you can start to imagine other ways of relationality. Certainly this question of colors as a way of organizing across things and, and metadata and whatnot. What are some of the, um, the ways that you're currently trying to think about the relationality that you can do in the digital that you can't do in the physical? Um, of thinking about the, all of the ways in which these artifacts that you have can connect to one another in order to create more complex stories. Um, I mean, this is the part where you get into territory of it's all correlation. It becomes, like what are some of the puzzles that you're currently, like that you guys are playing with now? Playing with now, I mean, well, right now we're just trying to, <laughs> we're dealing with, with the fallout of this, but, um, you know, some of the stuff we'd like to be able to do is, uh, is shape analysis, so that you can arrive and see things that are round, right? So a lot of computer vision stuff, um, but not trying to, not trying to second guess what people are looking for, but to give them some constraints to operate in, to have an opinion about how the objects are framed, even if that's as much as saying, this is round, this is square. Um, bridging stuff across uh, institutions, so people is a big one. Um, a lot of data visualization, which we just never, you know, had the time to do. Um, you, you, one of the things we just kind of silently turned on, it was an experimental feature for a long time, and we're just like, whatever, we're just going to put it on all the object pages, is um, there's a timeline at the bottom of every object now, uh, and the timeline is constrained by uh, 
Andrew Carnegie's birth <laughs> and the museum reopening. And before Andrew Carnegie's birth, there was simply the past. <laughs> um, and then after 2014, there is simply the future. Uh, and in between all of that are a number of dates largely associated with the people, not largely, entirely associated with the people involved with the building. Um, so Andrew Carnegie's birth and death, the Hewitt sisters, uh, when the museum, the Cooper Hewitt was originally a museum of decorative arts that was down at Cooper Union, so the history of that. Uh, when it became part of the Smithsonian and when we moved the collection into the building. So again, trying to do, and what you see is the overlap, and you start to see the density of, of those simultaneous occurrences. And then you simply take the object and you're like, this object was made here. It was acquired here. Um, I think that's it. Uh, but to start to, to start to show fence posts. I mean, I'm not sure so that. Can, I can't help but think, you know, you go back to this panopticon of taste. Part of what's intriguing to me is that the more that you can think through the relationality and think through the networks of those objects, the more you, you know, if you actually do take all of these tagging pieces and you see what people are tagging in connection, with very little, you know, you have no idea why, but, you know, there's something about that ma network map of, like, thinking about all the ways in which these objects relate to one another, not even about things that are visual, but things that are somehow at their core. And that's one of the reasons why I don't think of it as replacing curatorial no. insight at all, but I think it's this sort of this interesting moment or what are the different ways in which you are invited to see. Yeah. And that process of seeing is something that, um, is a really neat opportunity of having data at these multiple levels. Um, and, you know, a good curator is really inviting you to see in one way or in a series of ways, but what are the different kind of multi-layered curatory activities that you can imagine around that? Yeah, I mean, you know, the other person who's doing a lot of work around this stuff these days is George Oates, um, who's in London now, and she's got a design consultancy, so she's been doing um, bespoke interfaces both for the British Museum uh, Museum of the Library, anyways, it's one of the two, um, as well as the Victorian Albert. Um, what we've been saying to people is that it is unfair and unrealistic of us to expect uh, that our visitors will arrive at the museum with 40 years of decorative arts knowledge. Like, and it's not because people are stupid, right? It's because people are be busy being awesome, dealing with like human rights issues. And they're perfectly capable of approaching the subject, but they need something other than, you know, sort of conversational shorthand that starts it off. And so what we've been trying to do is just provide avenues in there. One of the things, so I mentioned briefly, we have these huge tables uh, that are throughout the museum. One, so you can, you can go around with the museum, you can collect stuff with your pen, and you can walk up to the table, and there's an antenna in there as well, so you tap it, and the table reads everything on your pen and shows you. And so then you can click on each one of those objects and we ask the curators to choose, for everything that's on display, choose 10 related objects from the collection, as well as to tag them individually. Tagging was a whole other story. It was crazy, it was really hard for them. Um, but we got them to choose related objects. And so what we've now been able to see, because we have all these stats, is in the two months that the pen's been on the floor, there have been something on the order of 600 to 650 instant, thousand, 650,000 instances of people collecting stuff, which is pretty great. Turns out people like to bookmark things. <laughs> um, and of those 650,000, that's 3,500 unique objects, which is awesome. Because I don't know if you remember, I just finished saying there's only 700 objects on display. So people are finding stuff in the collection and bookmarking it. Suddenly there's a way back into the breadth because the, the museum, again, the museum began life as a decorative arts museum and it was a sort of a weird bird. And it was housed, the story that I say is that it was housed down at Cooper Union, which is only relevant in that the Hewitt sisters were Peter Cooper's granddaughters, and they were all cut from the same cloth, which is to say if Peter Cooper wanted people to have the best education that you didn't need money to buy, 
the Hewitt sisters wanted to create what's referred to as a working collection, that the Decorative Arts Museum was meant to be a resource for professional and amateur craftspeople, because there was no design back then. So we have all the forks. We have all the hats. We actually don't have the hats. We have the boxes that the hats went in. Um, and what you would do is you would come to the museum, and they would get it all out. And it was kind of like what you see in open storage in museums these days. And they would just show you all the stuff, and you would sketch it, and that was how you would learn. Um, and then we made the transition to a design museum, but you know, there isn't one chair any more now than there was back then. Um, so I think you know, trying, to, trying to just think about ways to show people what that push and pull, and especially with design issues, Right? Like there's so many competing interests that push and pull on how something gets to market. Um, that thing, uh, so one of the things about NFC, if you don't know, so it's radio frequencies, and radio frequencies are incredibly sensitive to any metal parts. Um, and that is uh, a capacitive stylus, uh, and the material is applied using a process called overmolding. And what that means is you take a substance and you heat it up to the point of it being viscous, and then you <coughs> spray it onto another substance and it hardens in place. Right? So there's a cylindrical well that the PCB goes into, that the batteries go into, uh, and then we spray the stylus stuff on it. And we got an, an email, we got a call from the manufacturers one day and they were like, so we have a problem. And we're like, okay, what now? And they said, it turns out the overmolding process is melting the body of the pen, which was made out of some kind of like future plastic. And they were like, it's melting it enough that the batteries don't go in. And we were like, uh, okay, what are you going to do? And they said, we have to make it the body, we have to make it out of aluminum. At which point the electronics people lost their mind. You know, that's just the, but you know, what digital what the ability to model and represent all of those factors digitally, and you can start to apply this to personal data. I mean, it's a bit of a stretch, but you can start to imagine. If you have those models, then you can start to, you know, you can start to, to add knobs to tweak stuff, right? You remember, you know, physics knobs were all the rage for a while in data visualization. And I remember when I worked at a data viz studio, um, we were doing some timeline work for a large English broadcasting corporation. <laughs> and they, they were super pleasant about it, but they were like, we're wondering if you could help us design some timelines for the troubles in Ireland. <laughs> and you're like, I'm not even from your crazy homeland, but even I know that's insane. Right? Like, oh yeah, there's just one linear narrative to that story. Um, so out of that was this idea of like, what if we had a, a physics knob for bias? Hmm. Which, you know, it's easy to say that because I don't know what the details are, but like, maybe that's just a conceptual sort of framework to carry in mind. But what does it mean for people to so I think that's what digital starts to make possible. Um, yeah, I guess we're time. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.